Okay. Good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Grassbound Robotics talk. I am Ani Shier, the Grass faculty host for today's talk. And joining me today in hosting the seminar are students, panelists, um, Jasleen Donora and Ben Schaefer. So Ben is a first year PhD student and Jasleen is a recent Robo MSc graduate. If you are joining us uh, via Zoom, please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. These will be answered during the Q&A panel at the end of the talk. If you are here in person, you will have an opportunity at the end of the talk to provide your questions to the panelists. So please be sure to use the handheld mic um, when speaking to our online, so when speaking, so our online audience will be able to hear your questions as well. So it is a great pleasure and honor for me to be introducing today's uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Seth Hutchinson. Professor Hutchinson is currently the professor and KUKA chair for robotics in the School of Interactive Computing at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He's also the executive director of the Institute for Robotics and Intelligent Machines at Georgia Tech. Before joining Georgia Tech, he was a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, where he served as the associate department head. His research contributions span a wide range of areas, including, but not limited to, visual servering, control, planning, robot manipulation, multi-robot systems, and much, much more. His work is not just pioneering, but transformative, earning him and his students many accolades over the years. So Seth's influence extends far beyond research. He has served as the president of the Robotics and Automation Society, the editor-in-chief for the IEEE Transactions on Robotics, and he has co-authored two seminal textbooks on robotics. So for all of you who are taking Meme 5200 or who have taken Meme 5200, um, Professor Hutchinson is the Hutchinson in um, Spong, Hutchinson, and... <laughs> I, that, that guy's still the, alive. Yes, <laughs> So please join me in welcoming Professor Seth Hutchinson. I don't think I need that. Uh, thank you, Ani. Um, it's delightful to be at, at Penn. I think it's like my third time to give a talk at Penn, and it's uh, it almost feels like a homecoming. I have more friends here maybe than uh, any other place, uh, including the hometown where I grew up. Uh, and most of those people didn't like me to start with anyway. Uh, but but in this room, there are a bunch of, uh, of colleagues and friends for a long time. So uh, that does two things. Uh, it, it makes me feel happy. And it also makes me feel stressed because if, if they're unhappy with what I say, then uh, I'm going to feel deeply humiliated in a lasting level. So I hope you guys will smile uh, nicely throughout the talk uh, as I give this. So uh, this is, is not the usual kind of talk I give. Usually I show up at a place and I've uh, co-authored a journal paper in the last year or so that I'm really happy with. And it's 40 minutes of here's that journal paper. Uh, and then, you know, 10 minutes of question and answers about that journal paper. And this is not that. This is more of a, uh, I decided to take a step back and look at some things uh, from, uh, you know, the perspective of a person who has a, a specific way of thinking about life and about particularly about robotics, right? So it's sort of motivated by, uh, I visited a university in the spring and a young lion of machine learning said to me uh, in a very polite and deferential way, how do you stay relevant without doing machine learning? Um, and he did not use the word dinosaur, but it was implied, right? And, and, uh, and this made me, I mean, I went home and thought hard about the, the role of somebody like me in today's landscape where data-driven methods are becoming extremely important. So here's my slide of, of model-based approaches, right? To sort of characterize, and this, 
it doesn't look like they're diverse, but actually two of these people are left-handed. Um, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a NASA slide, right? So it's from long, long ago. And, and this is what's happening today, right? Today you have companies like Google that can put a few dozen robots in a room, uh, loads of computers in the background, and those folks can solve a bunch of problems that have been with us since the beginning uh, of robotics. And I'm using the word solve uh, somewhat loosely, right? All these problems, there are still things that one could do. There are still open questions surrounding them. But a lot of stuff that 10 years ago was regarded as really pretty difficult. How are we going to do that? Uh, a number of those things now with big data-driven approaches, one can just do. You've probably all seen videos of robot hands manipulating Rubik's Cubes. You've probably all seen this GIF or some version of it of the, of the Google robot farm learning how to manipulate toys. You've probably all seen videos of quadrupeds uh, that start flailing around on the ground and 20 minutes later are leaping and jumping and having a good time in their environment. Right? So uh, all these things are happening. A lot of them are happening with methods that have nothing explicitly model-based anywhere. Right? So a lot of them are uh, deep learning together with reinforcement learning, some combination of those, maybe tilting to one end or the other of that kind of spectrum. And uh, at best, you might say that there are some implicit models there that we don't know how to get our hands on and that we can't really describe, we can't access in any kind of way that's, uh, that's useful in terms of explaining what's going on. Uh, but maybe we would argue there are models inside, and maybe you would argue that they are not, right? That, that becomes almost a philosophical or religious kind of question. But for sure, there's nothing recognizable uh, to the dudes on the ladder with the chalk in terms of, of what a model might look like. And that then brings the question to mind is, is there even a place these days for model-based methods in robotics? In this part of the talk, I tell you, if you have to leave early, the answer is going to be yes. Uh, so, and and, uh, and if you stay, you'll come to that conclusion alone. Right. So, uh, some things to think about. Like when I when I went home from the conversation with the the young person who questioned my relevance in today's modern society, uh, I started asking myself, why am I not doing this? Right, because I've been doing robotics for a long time. And I've done robotics on a variety of different systems, and some of them are incredibly hard to model. And so what is the thing that has kept me out of that game? And there are a few things that leapt out at me very quickly that you'll see reinforced throughout the talk that I, that I give today. Um, when you're doing things with big data, you have to get the data, and getting the data can be super expensive. It can be time-consuming, and it can be dangerous. Expensive, uh, the expenses can accrue every time your fragile robot breaks uh, and you have to replace parts, or it can accrue because your robot break and now it takes five days to replace it and get it back in uh, into service. And so the expense is not dollars, it's time that was wasted. Uh, you immediately think that's all right, I can do simulations and that saves me all that trouble. But simulations are, uh, are realistic only for systems that are realistically simulatable. Right. And many systems are not, particularly if the dynamics are, are, are very complicated. As the, as the complexity of the dynamics increases, the more difficult it is to do uh, high fidelity simulations. And at the moment you start to introduce stochasticity, uh, you have even more difficulty doing simulations that will be credible. And this uh, introduces the, what everybody knows now is the sim to real gap. And the bigger that gap is, the, the more difficult it is to make that transition from your simulation package to your real world robot doing cool things. Um, and then finally, choosing the right data is hard. Uh, it's hard if you turn your robot loose and have it just roam around doing autonomous exploration of its space of actions and possibilities in the world. But it's even hard if you try to curate the data by putting an expert in the room with the robot and letting the expert figure out how to train the robot. Right? You still will run into difficulties. And you'll see some of that uh, in the, as the talk goes on today as well. Model-based approaches give you a bunch of advantages. Um, this is a time for me. I'll, I'll just I'm going to plug a survey paper that Michael poses the second author on because uh, I read it in the last few days and and I was sad because it said a bunch of things that were already in my slide and I felt like now I have to acknowledge the other guy who wrote about it first. Um, things like models admit provable guarantees of performance. Admittedly, only about. Uh, the model itself, but if you are good at modeling and you have good models, and this is sometimes a, a very good proxy for 
real confidence that a system will be safe. Um, it turns out, and many of you already know this, uh, reasonable models and even you know moderately unreasonable models together with good feedback controllers can give you good performance. Right? So you have a way with a model to sort of access some structure that you can exploit in your control design quite often. Um, and then finally, if you have models, you have a way to do optimization that uh, has become the thing these days, in, uh, especially in control, but uh, for a long time in design. And I'm going to talk about all these kinds of things in the context of a few experimental platforms uh, over the last years that I've been working with or that I have been involved with. And I'm going to start with this bat robot project. Uh, we finished this up about four years ago now. So um, I'm not going to talk at all about the, the sort of science in the bat robot project specifically. I want to talk more about uh, the role of data and modeling and design and how those things go together. Right? So it's a somewhat different view than the, the usual one I would give. If you're looking at biologically inspired robots, and thinking about how you can be a big data person in the world of bio-inspired ro robots, the first question that you should ask is, uh, what data can I get my hands on? And it turns out that for us, for the case of bats anyway, uh, there were three kinds of data that we could easily get our hands on. One kind, and easily is not right. Uh, we could get our hands on with some effort, right? One of them is real bats. One of them is robot bats flying around in the world with a motion capture system. And one of them is a robot bat or some sub-mechanism of that robot bat uh, strapped onto a load cell so that you can do a bunch of measurements. Uh, and this slide and uh, the next slides, I, I, I want to be sure that you know, I have never done an experiment with a biological bat. Every piece of data that you see about biological bats came from uh, Kenny Breuer and Sharon Schwartz, who are at Brown University. Uh, we collaborated with them on this project uh, for a few years. They did all the data gathering. Um, they're the biologists, right? They're the ones who know how to make the bats do things. When you look at a biological bat and you think, I'd like to build me one of those and have him fly around like bats do, uh, very quickly, you realize that you're not going to do that if your eye of if your idea of doing that is to copy the structure of the biological entity sort of verbatim, right? The idea that I'm gonna make a, a robot that has 40 degrees of freedom and some of those degrees of freedom will be ball and socket joints and, uh, and there's gonna be uh, unactuated degrees of freedom and coupled degrees of freedom and it's all gonna be anything that weighs less than 100 grams and also that includes its power supply and also its brains. Uh, it's not going to happen, right? You're not going to be able to design that kind of system and have it fly around. Uh, at, the, at the point when you're able to design that kind of system, uh, it has to be big to fit all the motors in and all the gears in. And as it becomes bigger, flapping flight stops working, right? So that's, that's why airplanes don't do flapping flight. That's one of the reasons is because uh, it's stuff about Reynolds numbers and aerodynamics, right? So you have to stay small if you want to flap your wings and fly. So uh, what can you do? If you've been doing robotics long enough, you will have seen people talk about grasping and the idea that you've got all these extra degrees of freedom in your hand that don't really, uh, they don't help you all that much because most of what you do, the motions live on some low dimensional subspace of the configuration space of the hand. And the, the biology guys doing grasping and even the robot guys doing grasping tend to use the word uh, synergies to describe these kinds of, of coupled interactions. Right, so that you can get uh, a low degree of freedom description of motions that are quite useful. Um, bats, if you look at that uh, skeletal structure of the bat wing, have a, a topological structure of their skeleton that's almost the same as the topological structure of your skeleton from the shoulder to the hand. Not quite as many fingers, right? And, and things are deformed, right? So the geometry is different, but the topology of the skeleton is very simple, and it cries out for applying the methods of, uh, of synergies to the motion. And so how do you get at that? Uh, it's, it's easy if you have biologists for friends who do this for a living. You put a bunch of motion capture markers on real live biological bats of different sizes. 
different weights that fly at different speeds. You put them in wind tunnels. You collect up all that data. Because you've got access to the skeletal structure of the bat, you can solve the inverse kinematics problems, and you can get back the joint trajectories for the individual joints. And when you do that, you find out that there are really only three interesting things that happen when a bat flies in a wind tunnel. And uh, in order to make them more interesting, biologists have created large words. And those large words mean flapping and folding, and also you have a tail that goes up and down. And those are the degrees of freedom that are interesting that bats exploit when they fly in wind tunnels. So the challenge is to build a mechanical structure that is uh, has all the properties that you need in a robot that flies. It has to be light, low power, et cetera, and that can somehow faithfully replicate these actions. Um, you can frame that as an optimization problem. First, write down all the parameters. There are two kinds of parameters, the time-bearing parameters that describe the motion of that robot over time and the fixed parameters that describe uh, the internal kinematic structure of the robot. I see, I see people taking pictures and that's why I go fast to like put the pressure on you to get the, the photograph snapped before it goes to the next one. And then maybe from time to time, I'll go back and you'll think you have another chance, but you don't. Um, uh, so, uh, um, sorry, sorry. Um, so how do you do that? Well, you can do that by designing. So the, the bat robot that I showed you, right, that's the end product, right? So you have to imagine that in the design stage, you have some notion of the topology of the skeleton, but no notion of the geometric parameters that go along with that. So how are you going to design it? Uh, the answer is hypothesize a bunch of parameters from that, you can hallucinate the markers as the robot flies through space, drop that into your simulation, and you can, uh, you can basically now do something like a principal components analysis on the data that's coming from the real bat that your friends collected in advance and the data that comes out of your simulation of the design bat. You, you can like truncate three or four principal values. I think we use three. Uh, do a Frobenius norm on the matrices that come back when you reconstruct and you minimize that, right? And when you do that, you get trajectories that look like this. And it's uh, it's kind of beautiful, right? I mean, the, the structures look similar. The motion looks similar. You might notice in the robot bat on your left, there's like a parallel mechanism in the shoulder that's there to give structural stability and, and get the right kind of folding mechanisms called a, a, a folding motions. That's a what mechanism. And yet you don't really even notice that when you watch the, the flight and you think, I've done data-driven robotics uh, and that bat doesn't fly. Right? And, uh, and this, um, this was surprising to me, right? We, have, we had a postdoc at the time uh, called Alireza Ramazani, and he and I had plenty of discussions about this. And I told him I was prepared to bet a lot of money that geometry was enough, right? And this came from my, uh, my belief from the motion planning community days in the 80s and the 90s that really geometry was all you needed to do anything interesting in robotics. Um, and I believe this even after having met Dan Kodichek, which is a it represents a failure on your part somehow in our communication. <laughs> um, but I thought that would be the case. And of course, there's a bunch of stuff that I just didn't think would be significant in the end. Uh, obviously, I think it's obvious if you just do motion capture on a bat flying through a wind tunnel, you don't get any idea at all about the forces or the torques that are being exerted either by the muscles of the bat or aerodynamic forces that are being used uh, and exploited to get flight. The inertia, uh, all the inertial parameters of our robot had nothing to do with the inertial parameters of biological systems. Like we had some places where there's like super high density that correspond to things like batteries and processor units, not at anything like a kind of nice quasi-uniform distribution of biological materials over a volume, right? So all the inertial parameters were off. Uh, just a bunch of stuff missing. But the good news is, I thought it was good news at the time, the mechanical engineers and the aerospace engineers, all the stuff that is missing from the data, we have pretty good models 
for most of that stuff. And there are some exceptions, right? There's a flexible membrane that's involved and we didn't ever try to model the flexible membrane, but that actually turned out to be something that you could sort of ignore. And I'll talk a little bit more in a minute. So uh, there's not a huge amount of math uh, in the talk, but I feel like I need to show you the structure of the equations. There's not anything here that should be surprising. In fact, um, one more. What is it? What is this? This is the usual kind of thing if you have robots doing locomotion, right? You've got a uh, a floating body uh, that's somehow making contact with its environment. If it's a legged robot, you've got contact forces, and the thing. Uh, sadly, I've used notation that conflicts with that community. Uh, the stuff that here is labeled as aerodynamic forces, which in the bat robot is where the hard part is. It would just be contact forces if you were doing locomotion, right? But you've got actuated degrees of freedom that are internal to the system. You've got unactuated degrees of freedom that the only access you have to those is sort of an implicit access by way of the interaction dynamics with the environment. And in our case, the interaction dynamics uh, will be aerodynamics. We used an aerodynamic model that I don't even care about. You shouldn't care about it either. The only reason I'm showing it to you is so that you'll know two things. Number one, we had an aerodynamic model. Number two, this is about as stupid an aerodynamic model as you can formulate. It treats both wings as planar, rigid objects, and everything aerodynamically that's happening can be expressed in terms of lift and drag coefficients that are functions of velocities and, and attack angles. Right? So it's a very simple model. You can, I mean, it, it's a very simple model that still takes some computation if you want to use it. Uh, you have to do some, you know, integration over the surfaces to figure out what the forces net will be. But you've got something you can get your hands on, and it's tractable even if a bit heavy um, and a bit naive. And once you have all this stuff, you can do trajectory planning, right? You can formulate a trajectory. We parameterize our trajectory using things like uh, flapping frequency, uh, folding frequency. Uh, that stuff all goes into this parameter called beta, which is a vector parameter. Uh, you can formulate a tracking error differentiated a couple of times to, to sort of ease away all the numerical instabilities that, that show up. And when you compute the derivatives of the tracking error, uh, the second derivatives, put them all together, you get an equation that looks like the thing on the bottom. And that's nice because it gives you an immediate and direct relationship between your desired trajectory and something about the actuated dynamics. Now you can solve this system from the bottom to the top. Right? You tell me the desired trajectory. I can figure out things about the actuated dynamics. I can dump them into the dynamic model and work my way up in those dynamics to figure out what the trajectory will be of the unactuated dynamics, which are the ones that you care about. Right, the unactuated dynamics are the ones for, uh, is the center of mass falling or remaining at a constant height? Uh, is there any kind of pitching that's happening that will cause you to, to do a dive? Right, These are the, the things that matter if you want to stay in the air that you have no direct control over. Um, this is a forward model. Right? You give me some stuff and I can compute what that system will do. And at the moment you have a forward model, you can do trajectory optimization, right? It's the usual formulation of uh, trajectory optimization. And in our case, all the stuff that was done uh, in terms of, of computing these, these models was done numerically. So you integrate numerically forward, we compute the gradients numerically. And uh, this is more model-based optimization. It's the second time now that you've seen it in the talk once about how do you design the robot and now how do you start to design the trajectory of that robot, right? So there's a bunch of model-based optimization that I don't know how to do without models. And when you do that, you get a robot that does fly. This is a reduced order model. It's just showing you a few degrees of freedom, but this gets the, uh, uh, the idea of what the simulation should look like. And then there's real... Where did he go? I hope I haven't hidden the slide. I've got a really nice slide of an actual bat flying, but maybe it's one more slide away. Um, anyway, that's the simulation. I'll show you. Yeah, I'm sorry. We're coming to experimental. I should have prepared. Um, control, I don't want to talk about at all, except to say you can use the kind of things that people do with locomotion, like this uh, Poincaré return map that sort of expresses the dynamics in terms of discrete events that happen. And the discrete events that happen for our robot are the wings get to the bottom, right? So the bottom of the downstroke, let's figure out where we are, figure out what we need to do to make life better for the next wing stroke. And the only thing that matters is you can write down the Poincaré return map, you can linearize it. And at the moment you linearize it, you get something that looks just like 
the start of an LQR problem and you can solve it just like an LQR problem. And when you do, you get bats that fly like this. Um, and this is the thing I miss most about Urbana-Champaign, the stock pavilion. We have no cows in Atlanta and therefore no need for a stock pavilion for field robotics tests. Um, what can we say retrospectively, having gone through that process? Uh, first, data's hard to get. Uh, and it's hard to get for the real robot, and it's hard to get for the bat robot. I'm sorry to get for the real bat, and it's hard to get for the for the bat robot. Uh, it's hard to get for the real bats for a lot of reasons. Uh, and the entire time we worked with Kenny and Sharon, I think exactly one of our students went out to visit and work with them. Uh, and that student had to get like rabies vaccinations and be convinced that the fact that he had to get rabies vaccinations should not put him off from the adventure that was ahead. Right? So it's, uh, it, there's some cost incurred, uh, even emotionally, at working with uh, real bats in that environment. Bats don't love flying in wind tunnels, right? I mean, if, if I were a super intelligent being and wanted to study your motion and picked you up and put you in a room and said, I'd like to see how you walk in this wind tunnel, uh, you know, I, I, the co cooperation would be short in its extent, right? And so bats too uh, like to lie on the floor in the wind tunnel rather than fly through the wind tunnel. Um, what's maybe more important than the fact that it's hard to get that data is the fact that it's hard to get the right data, right? So we acquired a lot of wrong data. And what do I mean by that? I've already told you that uh, there's a bunch of force, a bunch of aerodynamics, torques, all that stuff off the table. There's no way to measure it. The other thing that we really went wrong with, uh, when we wrote the NSF proposal for this work, we talked about the, the beautiful agility found in nature in the flight of bats. I mean, you, you watch a video of a bat and they like dart around and they can catch insects and it's, it's beautiful and it's fast. It can even be exciting. Uh, and we decided we wanted to do that. And so we spent a lot of time, or Karen and, uh, uh, sorry, Kenny and Sharon spent a lot of time acquiring data from bats, not doing anything like that, right? Bats flying in a straight line in a wind tunnel. And so we developed a bat that was optimized to do the most boring thing a bat could ever do. Um, it's it's harder still to get that data. If you want the agility kind of stuff in your data collection from biology, that's also quite difficult to do. And we never did that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we had some good models and those good models admitted optimization-based approaches. Not everything has good models, right? There's nothing up here about the flexible membrane. The flexible membranes, both in the biological uh, bat and in the robot bat are cool. As you flap your wing down, it's it, the, the, the membrane fills with air and at the bottom of the downstroke, it, stroke, it pushes it out, right? And so you have this kind of analog aerodynamic amplifier that's for free. Uh, and that's actually a, a handy thing to have, right? So it turns out that the, the poor modeling helps us keep the bat in the air because of that. Uh, and then this uh, closed loop control gives good performance uh, even with really naive aerodynamics. There are some caveats here. Is there another bullet? There is another bullet. Um, everything that we did on the control side uh, that I glossed over very quickly uh, comes back to a linearization of something that's pretty complicated. And that linearization is not very good if you're not very close to the points about which you linearize. Remember, the answer is yes. Models are good. <laughs> right. If you if you get away from that desired trajectory where you did all your work linearizing, uh, these break down very quickly. And so what I you know almost flippantly described as an LQR problem that we solved, uh, that is not something that we're solving in real time in the tiny tiny brain of the bat robot. That's something that we're solving offline for a desired trajectory, computing fixed gains that we give to the controller. And at that moment, you understand that really what I've said is it's PD control. And we waved our hands in a fancy way to come up with those gains, right? And you might wonder, how did that bat fly so elegantly and so gracefully? And part of the answer is, uh, Ali Reza knows how to initialize the trajectory of the bat to match the initial conditions about 
which we linearized uh, for the trajectory, right? So if you don't know how to throw the bat at the right velocity, uh, your bat's not going to succeed, right? So there's a, a lot of sort of secret hidden stuff, which by the way, this part of the talk is not included when I go around and talk about the cool bat robot stuff. This is an admission that comes only in the retrospective view of research talk. So this is extra. Right? Uh, but that was an important lesson for me. And in terms of the relationships between data-driven approaches and model-driven approaches, there's a lot of talk in the machine learning world about out of distribution errors and how can we deal with that. And there's a lot of talk in the model-based world about aha, out of distribution errors, models can handle that. But in fact, there are some strong analogies that you can draw between learning systems that don't visit pieces of the state space and model-based systems that in the end are really only good uh, around areas that have been linearized, right? So there are some, some analogies there uh, for what they're worth. Here's the second example that I'm gonna show you. This is soft continuum robot arms. Uh, this was done by a student called uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Ali Al-Baladi at the University of Illinois. Also, uh, after I left, we continued working. He was my student. I left, and then he joined uh, the group of Girish Krishnan. And he and I had been working on visual servo control. He met Girish, who was working on flexible robots, and cool stuff happened, a lot of it because of Girish. This is the, uh, the flexible robot slide. Probably all of you know what they are. Uh, the kinds that I'm going to talk about here are just restricted to the, the tubes that you fill with air. And when you push air into the tube, it changes the shape of the tube. We're going to do vision-based control. We've got a couple of cameras. One is at the shoulder. One is at the end effector. Uh, this is the, the design of Girish. It's very cool. You take a hose or a flexible tube, and you wrap thread around it. And then you go back, and you wrap thread around it again so that the threads cross at an angle. And the angle at which the threads cross determines what happens when you increase the air pressure, right? So you can see here a couple of examples, one kind of thread winding that causes the, the tube to expand under air pressure and one that causes it to bend when you add the air pressure. And then here you can see uh, a motion of a robot that's made by taking three of these things and strapping them together. And the trick is to take three of them that have different thread winding patterns. And you sort of can think of this as uh, I've got three inputs and each of them gives me access to one degree of freedom in this sort of control vector space, which is three dimensional, right? So you can think of these three things as being kinds of basis vectors uh, in that space, if that's uh, something you're comfortable with. Uh, how do you model these things? Uh, it's, it's not nearly as difficult as you might think for the geometry, right? You have a uh, some length along the tube parameterized by S. That's just an arc length. You have a rotation matrix that tells you the orientation of the frame as you go down the tube. You have internal stresses that cause uh, basically stretching. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, and those are Q. And then you have the same kind of thing, but for bending, the equations are slightly different. Are there hats yet? Yeah, there are hats. Every time you see a hat, and I realized uh, in, when I was preparing this talk and it was just too much trouble to fix it, uh, a lot of people think hat means estimation, and today hat means skew symmetric matrix, right? So <clears throat> all the vision guys are like, yeah, skew symmetric matrix, that's what hats mean to us. And all the estimation people are like, oh, no. Uh, so that's how it's going to be. Hats are for skew symmetric matrices today. Um, also, for these devices that we're making experimentally, uh, it's, it's very simple. You can't really exert any kind of stresses on them perpendicular to the axis of the device. All you can do is stretch them in terms of the force, right? So it's just one degree of freedom there. And now you have shape equations. <clears throat> how are you gonna model that flexible system? Uh, and this is how we decided to do it using the Kazarat rod model, which is fairly popular. And it's really cool, right? You have all these terms, basically everything that you might think is important to a flexible robot is in there somewhere. And yet it's not very complicated, right? But you can, you can get your hands very quickly on what each one of those terms mean. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's a moderately intricate model for the shape of this thing under external inputs and external forces. And you have two kinds of external forces. One is maybe there's a load at the tip and the other is gravity is just always pulling the arm down anyway. And the inputs are just pressures, air pressures to the device. If you look at one of these things with a camera, Right? You can measure or you can model, I shouldn't say measure yet, you can model what happens. If I change the pressure by a differential amount, what happens is the tip of the end effector moves by a little bit. 
And when that happens, the image that I see changes by a little bit. And so you have basically a concatenation of Jacobians with the occasional coordinate transformation to make sure everything's in the right frame. Um, we have not the right in the visual servo world to call that mapping uh, to the image a Jacobian because it's not the partial derivatives of anything. And the French people get really precise about that. So we call that the interaction matrix instead. But it's exactly the same idea as a manipulator Jacobian, which also doesn't have partial derivatives inside. But that's the vernacular. And you can do that with, whether the camera is at the shoulder watching or whether the camera is at the end effector. And if you look at the two uh, two layers of this, the only difference is there's a coordinate transformation in that, that's different that gets you from uh, camera frame back to the tool frame, right? That depends on where the camera is located. Um, I forgot to hide this slide. Oh, no, this is the visual servo slide. How do you do visual servo control? No, don't do that. Uh, how do you do visual servo control? You take the error and you multiply it by a pseudo inverse of all that stuff. And that gives you basically proportional control. And that works great for any system where the dynamics are not very important, right? Kinematic control, this is a, a fine way to do things. And all the visual servo literature, up until the moment quadrotors came to the visual servo community, it was just this kinematic control law with a lot of discussion about what should go into this interaction matrix and so forth. You might think, but it's a flexible robot. The dynamics are going to matter. But you would be wrong because we move slow. Uh, and if you move slowly enough, uh, you have the right to use the word quasi-static to describe the motion, which is what we shall do. Right? There won't be any oscillations that are induced by fast motion in this work. It's quasi-static motion. And therefore, you can ignore all the kind of dynamics effects in your control law. And of course, you can do the same thing um, for uh, image-based or position-based. The thing that's highlighted on this slide, but it's not as uh, conspicuous as I'd like it to be, is the J, right? There's an orange box around the J. That's the task Jacobian that relates differential changes in the input air pressure to differential changes in the position and orientation of the end effector. And where does that come from? Uh, that comes from the Kosserat rod equations, but you have to do some differentiation. It takes a couple of pages of the thesis, but in the end, that's why Ali Reza got his PhD. And this is the, the equation that comes out that lets you estimate that. There's now, this is just a, a two point boundary value problem that you can solve, right? Uh, if, you, if you know where the end effector is and you do because you've got vision looking at the system uh, and you know what the inputs are, you can, uh, you can solve this two point boundary value problem to figure out what that Jacobian is. Now you can do image-based control. It's nice because it's all model-based. And so you can uh, you can adapt this model over time. If the parameters of your robot change, if you get a more or less flexible tube, or if you change the structure of the thread winding so that you get different degrees of freedom in actuation, you can generalize this however you like. And now you can do experiments. These are the, the kinds of things I'm gonna show you for experiments. There's a, the robot's got a big old camera on the end, uh, no clever computer vision here. It's all just uh, QR code uh, tags that you, can, uh, that you can easily find and track. And in the top middle, you see the image that the camera sees. We're doing this with spherical imaging instead of just uh, you know, the usual perspective projection uh, for a variety of implementation reasons. And here is the first example, which should be uh, you know, sort of anticlimactic because if I couldn't show you this example, why did I include the last 10 slides? It, it, sure, you can make this thing move around to get the targets in the image where you'd like it to be. You can sequence up the targets and do trajectory planning and visit them in sequence. And if you do, you get trajectories that look like this. You can also disturb this thing. So in this case, uh, Ali has dropped a weight of 35 grams onto the tip. And when that happens, you see that the motion changes, but so feedback uh, control takes care of all that in a nice way. And eventually you get back to where you want to be. System's pretty happy. You can also, uh, uh, and you probably do this first if you're a PhD student, this is the first experiment you do, is you just like sort of reach in and tug on the thing as it's uh, trying to move around in the world to see what happens. So this is a string attached to the robot and Ali pulling on the string. And again, you see that the tracking, uh, it's pretty good even with him uh, pulling back and forth. You can take these things and sequence them up, right? So here's two of them in, uh, in sequence. That gives you more degrees of freedom. And with more degrees of freedom, you should be able to track more targets. Obviously, there's a limit on how, how much you can extend that. Uh, but here, we're tracking two. 
right? And so the, the Jacobian obviously is more complicated, but you can still do tracking and position now of two things in the image. And that is the end of flexible continuum robots. And what can you say? First of all, uh, this addresses the issue of simulation, right? The simulating the system is not easy to do uh, because it's a, it's a flexible system and it's governed by, you know, differential equations that uh, aren't always friendly. Uh, and trying to simulate this well enough to get the so-called pixels to torque, or in this case, pixels to air pressure mapping, uh, I think there's not much hope for that uh, at the simulation level. Happily, again, uh, if you wrap the right feedback controller around it, mediocre models can give you pretty good performance. And in this case, the mediocrity of the model comes from using the Kozarot rod equations and doing some numerical computations to solve the two-point boundary, boundary value problem to estimate the Jacobian, uh, the task Jacobian as you're doing stuff, got all those advantages. I'll mention that there is a place for data-driven methods here. And in fact, there's another chapter in the thesis of Ali that I'm not going to talk about today, where he estimates the image Jacobian um, using a bunch of data. And basically that means you put the camera in the scene, you move it around a little bit from a bunch of different configurations, and you collect up the relationships between input perturbations and output perturbations, and you dump them into your favorite learner and you get out some, uh, some kind of representation of that mapping. And that's all I'm saying about flexible robots. My panelists are keeping everybody under control. Nobody's interjecting with, with questions. And that's perfect. Next is cable-driven graffiti robots. Because why? Because we live in Atlanta. It's like rap, hip-hop, and graffiti is what we do. Uh, and so this is uh, Jerry Chen. He's a student that works with me and with Frank Dellert. And the, the problem is very broadly, can robots make art? And this is one specific instance of the question, can robots make art? Um, and it's uh, the answer is yes, of course they can, but then you have to argue about what art means. So it's a cable-driven robot. It's got four cables. That means four motors and four pulleys. The red lines show you the cables. The motors are over here. Um, there's a, an end effector that holds paint cans and this is what it looks like in action here with the cables superimposed. Uh, we didn't spend any money on clever design for, you have to change the color of the paint by hand if you want to do graffiti. So uh, otherwise everything is autonomous. And this is how we think about that system. There's two pieces. There's the piece that you do offline and there's the piece that you do online during execution. The offline piece is everything on the left. And for this robot, uh, that involves some kind of trajectory optimization. And then let's compute uh, LQR gains for controlling the system, and let's compute you know, the optimal Kalman gains for doing the estimation of the system. All of this being done about the trajectory that we just uh, created using the optimizer. And we hand all that off to the real-time system that, uh, that implements it. And every bit of what's done on the left is done with factor graphs. And if you know Frank Dellert, you already knew this was coming. I see people nodding, yeah, of course, Frank is his factor graphs. Uh, and GT Sam is the package doing the heavy lifting. Factor graphs, um, it, it's, it's, I have to be careful because it's recorded and Frank may see this. Um, they're good, uh, but it's just, it's, it's, it's one way that you can solve this problem. The nice thing about problems like this and factor graphs is, the structure of the graph that corresponds to this problem is, is fairly sparse. And for sparse factor graphs, there are computational tools that are very fast and can do the optimization very effectively. And so all the optimization is done using uh, these built-in, uh, basically built-in algorithms in GTSAM. And it's, it's not significantly different conceptually from doing dynamic programming or your favorite algorithm uh, that sort of works from the end backwards, right? There's a variable elimination algorithm. You can think of it that way, but I, I like to think of it as a kind of fancy dynamic programming. And now you can do uh, whatever you like, right? You can optimize the trajectory by trying to minimize time. You can pose a quadratic uh, opti uh, uh, performance criterion that you care about and minimize that. Here's an example that shows you, I wanna do it fast on the left and I wanna uh, care about how much torque is being exerted on the motors on the right. 
And you see, obviously, on the left, if you want to do it fast, you get something that looks like bang, bang. And if you want to optimize something about the torque, you get something that doesn't look at all like bang, bang. And when you look at the output, you can see that the fast one is faster, but it's also sloppy. And the slower one gives you a more faithful, uh, you, you have to infer that we wanted it to look like a star. But at the moment you infer what the goal was, you can see which one performed better, both in terms of speed or in terms of uh, accuracy. There's a bunch of data that you could use and that we will use, that Jerry's working on now. Uh, but that data has nothing to do with the robot, right? That has to do with what should that robot be doing. And so there are at least a couple of kinds of things that you can do. So Jerry's taking this thing out to a bunch of different places with an iPad that basically lets artists do teleoperated graffiti, right? So you take your iPad, you draw stuff, and it materializes on the wall. We also, uh, because Frank, in addition to being a factor graph guy, is from the Netherlands. We brought a graffiti artist from the Netherlands into a motion capture lab, and now we like own his font set, right? So this this famous Dutch graffiti artist, we have his fonts motion captured. And so uh, that's another way to do data, or to collect data and use it. And here's what you can learn from all of that stuff. First, uh, as usual, you get optimization-based methods out if you've got models going in. Um, there's some nice structural properties of these problems that lend themselves to implementation on factor graphs, and that's nice. You can change the performance objective very, very easily, right? So we to, to go from time optimal control to don't be too aggressive on the torques kind of control was a trivial change of performance objective into the factor graph formulation, right? So that was quite handy. Uh, and you can optimize the parameters of your choice. Reasonable models, feedback control gets good performance. In this case, really good performance, right? So with the bat robot, I told you, uh, if you miss a little bit on the initial trajectories, you just lose. With the cable-driven robot, you don't miss uh, because the cable-driven robot, we understand really well cable dynamics and the motor dynamics. There's some unmodeled friction that comes into play that has to be accounted for. But for the most part, uh, that system, we have a really good model. And so when we predict the desired trajectory and compute a bunch of gains around that trajectory using linearization, that's all going to be fine in practice. And I can't imagine, the only way that turns out not to be fine is if somebody replaces the paint can with something that weighs a lot more than a paint can. And uh, the difference between a full paint can and an empty spray paint can, not significant with respect to this robot. Um, the place where data might be interesting in this, and I, and I think it will be, is uh, dealing with the, the desired trajectories for this system, answering the questions of what should this robot be doing now that I have a robot that will do what I say in the way that I please, right? So what should it be doing is the kind of question where collecting a bunch of data is quite feasible because not only do you have access to people, but you have access to image data sets that you can pretty easily convert uh, back into the kind of thing uh, that would be input for a graffiti system, right? And so, uh, you know, Jerry's looking at diffusion-based methods at the moment to generate input trajectories for these things. And I don't know, I think it will be cool. Uh, if it is, then I'll include that in the next talk. Um, here's the last thing I'm going to talk about. It's a uh, safe human-robot interaction, right? So, um, this is a, a KUKA robot interacting with a human. And this is really, um, interaction maybe overstates that, right? There's like no physical contact in the stuff I'm going to show you today. We've done some physical interaction experiments, but you're not going to see them today. So um, what's the, the reason for this? <clears throat> if you're going to do HRI, you want to promise that the robot's not going to hurt the human. And if you can't promise that the robot's not going to hurt the human, then unless you're a famous rich dude with a car company, you should not be in that business. Right? Maybe you shouldn't in the other case as well, but we won't go too far into auto autonomous driving today. Right? So you need to be able to make promises. You can't make promises if you don't have something to reason about. The thing to reason about in this case is models. The nice thing about, no, no, one of the nice things, because there are a lot of nice things about mobile manipulators is there's no mystery left in the world about how those things work in terms of the dynamics and the control, right? If you give me a KUKA robot arm, there's not gonna be any surprise there. If there is, I'm sending it back, 
I mean, it's, it's a well understood system. I know how to do a variety of control methods. Inverse dynamics is the, the one that's just sort of leaps out and calls to be used. And so that's the one that we use. <clears throat> and at that moment, you have a model that you can feel pretty confident that if you prove things using that model, you can say to the end user, I have proven some things, you will be okay. Right? And, and you'll see that bravado, uh, I think, in Sergio's interactions with these robots, right? That he believes in this model-based stuff. Um, we have approached this problem using two kinds of mathematical techniques that are pretty well known to roboticists. Certainly, uh, control the Apinov functions. I think by now, roboticists are, are using like crazy. We all know what they are. And more and more uh, control barrier functions are being used. And so what are we doing? We're using the control the Apinov stuff to, to get the performance guarantees. And we're using the control barrier functions to get the safety guarantees. We want to do all of that stuff in the operational space where the human's living, not in the configuration or state space uh, of the robot, right? Because we want everything to be you know, very conspicuous, very easy to understand and formulated in a way that corresponds to the task at, at an intuitive level. We all know by now too, how to do operational space dynamics, right? You, uh, you differentiate the, uh, the, you know, the forward kinematic map a couple of times in the right way. You get a Jacobian relationship between uh, what's happening at the motors and what's happening at the hands, both in terms of velocities and torques. You substitute that into your usual Lagrange Euler equations. You get something like what's at the bottom, you group the terms and it's the usual control of fine form, right? So at this moment, you don't even have to think about robots anymore, right? You've got this nice control affine framework and you can do all the stuff that you like there with your control the Apinov functions and your control barrier functions. And that's what I'm gonna do. All right, so uh, I will just put one slide up to show that, yeah, it's inverse dynamics that's required. And just to remind you that every time I talk about inverse dynamics and talk about these mappings back and forth, there is a Jacobian matrix in there and if it becomes singular, there are problems. And so you have to take care. Right, so I'll say more about how you take care later, but don't don't just believe in this without realizing there are at least a couple of caveats. Um, for safety, we take a super uh, straightforward approach. And in fact, I think this is cool because I think one of the first places to use uh, super quadrics to do anything was the GRASP lab to do vision to represent shape back in the 80s. I mean, I feel like Rujina might have her name on a paper about using super quadrics. And um, this is the same idea. Put uh, ellipsoids around the things that you don't want to hit and then make sure that you don't go inside the ellipsoids. And so you can write down the equation for an ellipsoid. You differentiate it until the input appears. The, the L's mean lead derivatives along vector fields. It's just, it's just uh, a nice concise notation for differentiation for the purpose of this talk. The relative degree is two. That means you have to go back to the literature and you have to find the paper from Srinath that tells you what to do in that case. And this is what you do in that case, right? This is the condition uh, that tells you that if you start in the safe set, you stay in the safe set, right? And now it's just constrained optimization. I want to minimize the norm between what I'm doing and what I want to do subject to making sure the barrier functions behave in the right way. That's all there is to that. And you can do the nominal trajectory. I'll talk in a minute about where that might come from. Um, yeah, you can avoid banging into things. Do the same thing with control the Apinov functions and you arrive to another constraint, not different conceptually, right? You differentiate stuff a bunch of times and then there's a condition on what that derivative should, should look like. And now you can do a big constraint optimization problem. Right, and... Uh, you can solve this in real time, right? There's not anything that's too heavy to be solved. Um, the part at the bottom, does it say? Yes, singularity. So one of the things you can do is you can add a constraint that looks at the manipulability Jacobian, or sorry, the manipulability measure associated to the Jacobian and make sure it never goes to zero, right? And if you if you do that, right, if you wrap an ellipsoid in the state space around that part of the, of the configuration space, you never have singularities. And therefore, you don't have to worry about the singularity stuff that I told you you should worry about. You should worry about it but only until this moment. And now, if you all just like, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And this is an example that shows you uh, how it works. So there's a simulated robot on the right, real robot on the left, a desired trajectory, which is uh, move around in an ellipse. Uh, you turn on some constraints and you see the robot change its behavior. All this stuff's happening down uh, in the controller, right? Using this constrained optimization 
uh, problem to be solved. Yeah, you take the constraint away and it jumps back to the trajectory that it wanted to follow. I think I'm going to skip ahead. I hope it skips ahead. Um, yep, uh, here's a more interesting trajectory. And when we turn on the constraints, uh, the constraints are going to move over time. And all this is just to show you that uh, this is a pretty good approach that controls things very well. And all the optimization that you might think is pretty heavy, you can do it all really fast. And in a minute, hopefully much less than a minute, uh, we'll get to... Um, oh, so this is with joint constraints. So um, there are boundaries on what the joints can do. You can express those in the configuration space, the state space, the same kind of optimization. And you can wrap an ellipsoid around Sergio's fist uh, and make sure that you don't bang into Sergio. Right, so it's just, this is just, it's all very low, not interesting tasks at all, right? The task is just move back and forth and don't bang into stuff. Um, and this should make you think, but Seth, you told me about the models of the robot. You didn't tell me about the models that your vision system was going to use to find Sergio. And so I'm not sure why he has such bravado when he interacts with this robot. Right, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. You can now uh, wrap whatever you like around the outside of this. So in this case, it's push a shopping cart with non-holonomic constraints and the wrist is not very powerful. And so I want to push this cart along a trajectory. And it, 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 for this particular robot and this particular cart, there's no place you can grasp that cart that lets you do this without breaking the wrist. And so there's an optimization problem inside figuring out where to put the hand with some cost associated to moving the hand such that at some moment the robot decides it's better for me to let go, put my hand on a different part of the cart and, and continue. And right? so it's another constrained optimization problem wrapped around the outside of the other one. Uh, and inside here is all the non-holonomic constraints and the dynamics of the robot subject to those constraints, et cetera. What can you learn about that? Um, the high fidelity models that we have for the robots, I think give you the right to say things and use the word guarantee about performance of robots. Um, what I didn't show you was that hidden inside, uh, there's some Coleman filtering stuff because you may not know exactly the inertial parameters of things like the cart that you're interacting with. And so we, we, uh, we have other experiments where you put a, a load in the cart and you, that actually can move around as the cart's moving. Well, I should say a lot of the experiments that happen here are motivated by the fact that Sergio has uh, twins that are like one year old and he's got a stroller that's side by side. And so dealing with the problem of pushing a cart with changing dynamics is dear to his heart uh, because when he goes to the grocery store, it's actually difficult. Uh, and so he's done a bunch of experiments where you know, one of his children is modeled by a heavy basketball or something. Um, what else? Safety guarantees are only as good as the vision system, but I don't care because I believe in my heart that the vision people have solved tracking Sergio. Right. There are off-the-shelf pieces of software now. YOLO is the one that's uh, getting the most uh, publicity. I think it's YOLO version 52 or something by now. Right. And it's it's incredibly good. And I, I think one has the right to use the word guarantee uh, until a bunch of people come in. And you, you obviously, you can find ways to thwart that system. But in reasonable HRI experiments, I think that's fair. Uh, and the message is, if you've got good models, you should just exploit them. And if you've got database methods or data-driven machine learning established methods that are available, you should take advantage of those as well. And that's basically the end of the talk, except for some sort of grand vision retrospection uh, captured on this slide. Um, that just says the same points that I've made a few times, uh, you know, scattered over different uh, examples, but all uh, captured here. The thing that I will say that I haven't said prior is the future, I think, involves a lot of model-based people talking to a lot of machine learning people in deeper and deeper ways. And so it's, it's already the case that conversations are happening between those groups, right? You've got learning for decision and control that's happening every year for the last three or four years now. And certainly people are having these kinds of conversations. Quite often what you find is that the interaction between those communities is a machine learning person says, I can learn your model for you, right? Or uh, a model-based person says, oh, you can use my models uh, as simulators to drive your machine learning algorithm. And these are, are still 
I think in the context of 20 years of future research ahead of us, uh, naive ways to combine model-based and data-driven approaches, right? So I think you can expect in the coming years that the, the interaction between those communities will become much deeper and the methods will become much more sophisticated. Um, I don't have a good prediction for what they will look like, but I don't need to. I'm going to go home tonight and you've got people in the room that know, uh, and you should be sure and ask them. Right? They're, they're, they're mainly in the front row down here, so some are in the back. And I will stop there and let the panel take charge. And this moment is why I did not sleep last night. <laughs> Seth, thank you for the uh, <laughs> terrific work and the and the beautiful, beautiful talk. Uh, you know, if you're a dinosaur, I'm a slime mold from the Precambrian era because <laughs> I don't only think that models are quite important, but I actually think that one can understand the nonlinear models and think about them globally. And what what I what I'm getting is, are, I certainly on this last slide, you, one would think that the uh, an important aspect of models is that it teaches us how to do modular things and how to do compositions. And in, in not instead of reference trajectories, but perhaps in with alliance to reference trajectories, they're reference dynamics. And the reference dynamics promise, I think, perhaps to be a, a next deeper step in the interaction of l learned things, which are just function approximators after all, with, um, with the modeled insights into dynamics. Are you, do, will you comment on how, I'm, not I, where where is the modularity and where's composition yeah, yeah. so I, I i'll be happy to come so the first comment is yes i everything you just said uh, i completely agree with you didn't see it in my talk because i haven't done any of those things so i got nothing to say uh in terms of of you know looking backward but uh this in fact is a conversation that uh i'm i feel like i had with michael just two days ago walking across the georgia tech campus uh, the the idea of being able to plan into the future to, to, com to some sort of compositionality, some ability to understand that what I'm doing now has implications downstream uh, in ways that may not have occurred before. Um, I think these are important things that models allow you to reason about. So I don't think you're going to get really uh, task in motion planning purely from the data-driven people. I was on a, a thesis committee just this week as well. Uh, and it was, a, it was a machine learning guy. He was using model predictive control and he was using machine learning to learn the models for his MPC. And he had acquired loads of data of human beings in a motion capture system, you know, running around and jumping and leaping and uh, not quite dancing because I think it was just students, but doing those kinds of maneuvers. He then, you know, chopped it up into snippets, learned the snippets, treated those as tokens, dropped them into something, uh, well, to a version of GPT and learned how to do token prediction over time. And what he found out almost immediately is the dancers fall down really quickly. And the reason that seems obvious to me is there's no notion of how these things, how, how what you're doing now impacts the future, right? And in this case, it's dynamics, right? There were no notion of dynamics. It was just token prediction at a kind of kinematic level and things should look smooth and fluid when they execute. But, uh, but you know, nevertheless, they were all falling down um, very quickly. I think this basic question of how do you get representations that let you make long-term strategies and plans using only knowledge that applies locally is one of the fundamental questions in robotics, whether that's how do I do linearization about trajectories or whether it's how do I express preconditions and outputs in a symbolic level for strips. I mean, I, I think this is a fundamental thing that until we know how to do that, all the way down from the dynamics up to the high-level planning level, we won't have autonomous robots doing clever things. 
And I think if you interact with something like chat GPT for even a short period of time, you understand that they don't have any sense of how to do that whatsoever, nor is there any clue from that community at the moment about how you might obtain that. Right? There's no, I, I should say, I haven't seen any clue. They, they may have clues and others may have seen it, but, but the ability to abstract away from something more than, and then what would happen to but there would be consequences to what happened and those interfere with my long-term objectives and how do I structure that? Uh, that I think is one of the underlying fundamental questions that uh, that exist at like five levels of, of the abstraction hierarchy in robotics, I think. And I have, uh, I, I got nothing to show you about that because um, the stuff that I do that has to do with planning is all symbolic high-level planning and uh, and just not consistent with with this. And, and the, the, the symbolic stuff is, you know, it has a tendency to be naive in its formulation because you abstract away all the interesting stuff and then figuring out how to connect the high-level symbolic descriptions that you can reason about with the low-level descriptions that actually have the dynamics that you have to care about. I think that's also still an open problem. I'm, I think I should stop. <laughs> I feel a little rambling now. So, But I think all the things I just said. You have a follow-up? Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> Thanks for the great talk. Um, so my question is, in your talk title and on how we usually talk about these things, we sort of draw these two circles of like model-based and database. Uh, and you kind of touched on this at the end, but like, it seems to me like, you know, with this whole sim to real gap issue, we take a model that we really believe in, like, you know, multi-body articulated system with some kind of contact model. And then we do a bunch of simulation of it to get data, but then we stick our heads in the sand and pretend this is a data-driven method, and it seems like it's very much model-based. Um, and on the other hand, we've got ways of learning models that enforce certain priors like Hamiltonian dynamics and things like that. And then we could either do data-driven control on them or we could do model-based control even because we enforce these structures. And it almost seems like there's there's two types of you know, how do we bring data into this problem that seem kind of distinct, which is maybe the point you're making at the end of your talk. Do you view these as like actually being different or that they're, you know, sort of two halves of the same coin? Well, so, I mean, I, I view them as being the endpoints on a spectrum. Right? And and I don't think the middle of the spectrum has been very well explored at this point. Well, maybe that's not true. Maybe the exact middle point is what has been explored, right? Where I'm going to take a, a convex combination of learn my model uh, or, you know, model for learning as opposed to any other interesting point on that spectrum. I mean, I, I also think what I just said is kind of, you know, high level and not very useful. <laughs> but yeah, I, I agree with you that, I, well, I believe that there's a continuum and I believe there will be interesting ways to integrate data into model-based methods and vice versa beyond the most naive patchwork that that uh, presents itself immediately. Hope so. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the great talks. Um, yeah, so I have a question about simulation. So some people would think of simulation as a kind of model and they say that now with NVIDIA, with all the AI chips and everything, it's progressing really, really fast. So they're saying uh, the speed at which simulation catches up to uh, what model-based folks do is gonna be uh, very fast, right? And so do you think that's gonna change your perspective on, um, on learning-based methods versus model-based methods? Or do you think uh, it's just too much worry right now? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm one of the people who thinks that if you're doing, you know, good simulation, there must be a good model inside. Right? And I, I, I mean, when I think about NVIDIA folks doing high fidelity simulation, let's say in real time, right, to predict what the robot should be doing next, I think of that as numerical MPC, right, and which is you know, maybe offends the MPC people, but that's sort of conceptually where I put it. Right, I've got a I've got a model. I drop some inputs in. I do shooting methods forward, and I take some convex combination of the outputs. For example, uh, a, like model predictive path intervals kind of a method that you can use if you have that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I don't think that's inconsistent. Uh, I I don't think the Nvidia guys would 
argue too. I, I, I'm not sure they would be angry with me at this point. They might be, but I, I don't think they would. Is that? Yeah, also, it's a very circular thing. Like, so, say if your simulation is really good, the learning folks would say we can now have a lot of data from the simulation. Yeah. But then if your simulation is already very good, then you can kind of do like numerical NPC, like you said, yeah. do like model-based stuff, right? So it's like a circular thing? It is. I mean, I almost, there, there are some, uh, there are some instances where I think um, it's not horrible to take a good model in a simulator and generate tons of data. So basically do function approximation on your system, right? And so you've got some sort of a real time implementation in a black box of what that system would do that saves you the trouble of doing real time uh, simulation, right? So um, if there are things, you know, for the bat robot that's flying with aerodynamics, uh, you're not going to do uh, computational fluid dynamics in real time. I, I, I don't think the NVIDIA guys are going to tell you that that's coming anytime too soon, right? So you're not going to do the aerodynamics faithfully. And at the moment, I say, oh, yeah, and the membrane is flexible, so here's another partial differential equation to drop into the mix. Uh, I mean, that's not going to happen in real time, I don't think. At least not while I'm alive. Maybe while you're alive. Any on Zoom? I have a question. So um, about the bat robot that you were showing, and um, you said that it would not never be able to do all those like sophisticated motions. Yeah. Um, so how would you go about solving that? If you had to, <laughs> because this is also data driven. Well, I mean, so the, the truthful answer to that is you may notice I'm no longer working on bat robots. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think if you're going to do that, you probably don't have recourse to biological data. It's hard to get the data. And you have to take a more first principles approach, right, where you uh, where you start. So there's, there is something interesting about, about bat flight that is easy to exploit. And it's, it's intuitive, right? When my wings are out, the aerodynamics matter. And when my wings are in, they do not, right? And when, because, uh, because of that, I can do the same thing cats do if I'm a bat to change my orientation quickly. Right? I mean, I can change, uh, I can do even just like centroidal moment, uh, momentum kinds of stuff, right? To change my shape to get the orientation to change quickly. The trick is, there are two tricks, right? One of them is you have to you have to fold your wings in and out very quickly and in a way that doesn't disturb the dynamics of the, uh, of the maneuver that you're executing. Uh, and the second trick is that it takes a lot of torque. And that means, well, we tried to do uh, maneuvering and we stripped gears, right? So that that's that's why we don't have experiments of that because we did not have the mechanical capacity to to withstand the aerodynamic torques of you know moving quickly and against air pressure to to do those kinds of inertial changes to control the angular momentum. Thank you so much. So let's thank our speaker and our panelists one last time. So as a quick reminder, a recording of today's talk and previously recorded talks can be found on our GRASP YouTube channel and website. We will not have a GRASP on robotics talk next Friday due to the Thanksgiving holiday. Please tune in the following Friday, December 1st at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for our next Grasp on Robotics talk featuring Dr. Nancy Amato from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. For more information on Oconee events, be sure to follow us on social media or check out our website. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.